Thanks for joining us. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm always interested in use of fire. And I think this topic, uh, using fire to manage biodiversity in the paddock, is very timely. We've certainly got a wet period now. Everything's green and there's no way that any grassland will carry a fire. But who knows? Maybe in the summer we'll have um, some hot spells, enough to dry out fuel, and there may be opportunities in the new year. If not, uh, I'm sure there'll be opportunities into the future. Um, next slide. Alex, there we are. Uh, this is an overview of what I'd like to speak about tonight, and I hope you find this interesting. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about Major Mitchell's ideas about the use of fire, and then talk about fire stick farming, which was a term developed uh, for the Aboriginal use of fire in managing the natural environment for their advantage. And then I want to talk in general terms about the responses to fire uh, of plants and animals, and then look at the bigger question of how fire affects the functioning of ecosystems. And then more specifically, I'd like to talk about the research work, uh, experimental work, which the uh, group I lead on restoration of native grasslands in the Jindera catchment, uh, I want to talk about that program and then talk about the post-fire effects on kangaroos and stock and finally get to a practical thing of can small landholders cool burn paddocks. Next slide. Major Mitchell travelled through almost all of Eastern Australia and over a number of expeditions in the 1830s and 40s. And at the end of his last ex expedition, he went back to London and wrote about his experiences, his diaries he published, and also he wrote these profound words, at least I think they're profound, about the role of fire which he had seen. And all the early explorers com commented on the almost continuous use of fire by Aboriginal people as they travelled along. Fire, grass, kangaroos and human inhabitants seem all dependent on each other for existence in Australia. For any one of these being wanting, the others could no longer continue. Fire is necessary to burn the grass and form those open forests in which we find the large forest kangaroo. Nature applies that fire to the grass at certain seasons, but for the simple process, the Australian woods had probably contained as thick a jungle as those of New Zealand or America, instead of the open forest in which the white man now find cattle, uh, sorry, find grass for their cattle. I think that was, that's a very profound statement. Um, and clearly Mitchell understood that fire uh, had created, regular use of fire by Aboriginal people had created open um, vegetation, which was very suitable for uh, cattle grazing and sheep grazing. Next slide. Coming a bit closer to home, I've always been impressed by this painting of Robert Hoddle, who was a surveyor through um, uh, Victoria and New South Wales. He painted this uh, in about 1832 of the Gillandera Creek, the catchment in which uh, um, I'm, uh, I do land caring. And the interesting thing about this image is that the vegetation is very open, certainly much more open than it is today. Um, and in his notebooks, he, he actually described in more detail the vegetation. 
And on the distant Brindabella Range, as you can see there, uh, he says that was just open grassland and there were very few trees on it. And today, of course, it's densely covered with, with trees. And the other interesting thing I find about this uh, painting is that the Aboriginal family uh, on the banks of the Jinadera Creek are looking into the distance towards uh, uh, a grazier with a dog behind him and a flock of sheep ahead. And so this painting was, uh, was painted at the time when pastoralism in our region was beginning. Next slide. In uh, the late 1960s, CSIRO was asked by a group of uh, pastoralists who lived around the uh, town of Louth on the banks of the Darling River to help them find a solution to the emerging shrub problem that was developing. Um, the 1950s had been very wet and, and no doubt they stopped heavily during that time. But the heavy rains also uh, germinate a lot of shrub seeds and by the grazing, there would be little competition between the grasses and the shrubs. And so they came to dominate. And these graziers thought that if CSIRO could solve the rabbit problem by introducing myxomatosis and solve the cactus problem, which was severe in northern New South Wales and uh, southern Queensland, by the introduction of Cactoblastis, then surely uh, a quick fix could be found um, by CSRO for their emerging shrub problem. Uh, but of course, there was no quick fix, but CSRO began fire studies at that time. And this is one of the uh, experimental plots um, in which um, sheep and goats were excluded by the fence, but kangaroos, of course, could jump into it and feed. Um, and we, we uh, that was set up in the late 1960s. And CSRO also began paddock scale uh, experiments. Next slide. And so paddocks were, uh, this, these were cooperating graziers who, uh, who, who, uh, wanted CSRO to burn their paddocks and to make measurements. And we did that. Next slide. And what we found was that Mitchell's argument was right. We found, uh, and this, uh, uh, these are a series of photographs, which I'm going to show you, the six and all, which show the effect of two fires in March, 1978, and again in, November 1984, and their effect in opening up the semi-arid woodland, killing shrubs and increasing plant diversity, and to our, uh, and it was also encouraging to find that the technique was economical to do, um, and it was later picked up by New South Wales uh, uh, government and recommended as a method for reducing down shrubs. So on the left, we have the, uh, the vegetation just before we burnt it. It was dominated by uh, woolly butt grass, Eragostis eriopita, uh, and there wasn't much else in, uh, in the uh, ground layer and plenty of emerging shrubs. Uh, they were mostly uh, Dodonia viscosa, which we get around here uh, in this region. And in the distance there are uh, acacia and neura mormogwa trees. Uh, in the September after that, the first fire, um, many of the, well, most of the woolly butt plants were killed because they have uh, rhizomes on the surface and they're very, they're not tolerant to fire and replaced by uh, many annual species and, uh, and the beginning of, of palatable grasses. Next slide. Seven years later, uh, a second fire was applied 
And, and a year later, the veg, it was a drought time and uh, the soil looks rather bare, but there are a lot of plants there. Next slide. And 11 years later and 27 years later, uh, that's what the vegetation at that point in the exclosure looked like. So in September 89, it was quite an open uh, woodland and uh, much uh, more suitable for grazing because of the emergence of, of two uh, particularly palatable grasses. Uh, and uh, the photograph 27 years after the initial fire shows a good uh, spread of, of palatable grasses, but also the emergence of, of shrubs again in the landscape. And it probably should have been burnt again at that time. Next image. So talking about uh, fire stick farming, uh, I found some notes which I've written down here uh, from a, a workshop held in 2012 with, with Rod Mason about his understanding of use of fire by uh, Aboriginal people. Um, Aboriginal people manage the natural world for what they needed. Um, so it was very much uh, a task which they used to get some benefit, presumably in food supply. And fire uh, was used to clean up country, and it still is, I guess, uh, and to look after particular plants. And there were strict laws about who can burn and when. Uh, and, Ab and Aboriginal people may not readily share these uh, uh, because uh, many of them are sort of sacred laws. And fires were never lit and left. Patches were burnt with the wind at one's back. And fire was a tool for managing the places they used and natural fires were not put out. Next image. So my understanding is that fire stick farming, that is cultural burning, is culture dependent and a sacred practice for Aboriginal people. Aboriginal fire knowledge on cool season burning can be and deserves to be used in caring for landscapes and biodiversity. And the feature of cool season burning, of course, is that the, the fires are patchy. The landscape is not burnt uh, from a fire line uh, where everything is, is consumed, as it were, uh, but patches are burnt and the fires are controlled. And uh, so there are burnt and unburnt areas remaining in the landscape. Next slide. Now, I just want to talk about uh, understanding about the plant and animal responses to fire. Some sp plant species die as a result of fire. And I guess an example of that would be mulga uh, in that image, which I showed uh, earlier. And uh, stored seed in either the soil or in woody fruits as in banksias and hakeas and other uh, woody fruited uh, um, shrubs and trees, um, the seed germinates and thereby continuing the population. And some species are adapted to survive fire and regrow from protected buds. Example, most of the eucalyptus species which have buds below the bark. Uh, and uh, they continue to hold the space that they'd previously won in competition with other plants. Um, the other thing is that the germination of the stored seed may be promoted uh, to germinate uh, by heat. And many of the acacia species, which have hard seeds, and some of the grasses uh, respond to heat. Uh, and also, uh, in addition, 
or, or separately, they would respond to smoke. And many grasses and forbs do this. And I want to talk about uh, why they respond to smoke a bit later. As far as the animals are concerned, uh, some just flee a fire. Birds and kangaroos that are quite mobile can uh, do that. Uh, others move into safe spaces, unburnt ground uh, and refugia, under rocks or uh, in uh, hollows and trees or hollows and logs on the ground. But others die and the population is renewed by migration from unburnt areas. Can we go? Yeah, there we are. Um, so we can say that for the Australia, Australian fauna and flora, the species are adapted using a whole range of mechanisms to survive slash flourish in a particular fire regime. And what I mean by a fire regime are these four components. The season of the fire, whether it's spring, summer or autumn, or even winter, the intensity of the fire, that is how much heat is being released along the fire line at any uh, time, the frequency of fires, whether it's every year, two years or, or longer, and the patchiness of the burn. Um, uh, the uh, a species um, may be adapted to fires that uh, are patchy, but not to to uh, continuous widespread fires. Next slide. And the effects of fire on ecosystems, uh, there are positive effects such as uh, heating of the soil, cracking of seed coats and triggering germination. And there are chemicals in smoke, particularly the strigolactones, which uh, so, uh, have plant hormone effects or hormone effects on the plant, stimulating growth um, and certainly stimulating germination of seed. And that's a well-established uh, fact now from a number of uh, research projects. Um, another positive effect of fire is opening of woody seed pods held in the canopy, releasing seed onto a fresh and fertile ash bed. And the Banksia species are a classic example of that. Um, Clearing of thick understory, reducing competition for seedlings is another effect, and encouraging new growth that feeds many animals, and creating hollows and logs and trees that can be used by animals for nesting and shelter. But there are some downsides of fire. Uh, fire can burn and damage plant communities, um, such as rainforests, um, they can kill or, individual, uh, kill or injure individual plants or animals and cause erosion and subsequent sedimentation of creeks and wetlands. And we've certainly seen that with the forest fires uh, of um, 2020. Uh, they also open up areas to weed and feral animal invasion, as well as human access and vandalism. Next slide. As I said, my particular interest is in the use of fire as a management of natural temperate grasslands. Um, I've shown on the left there uh, in sort of orangey yellow, the original distribution of these uh, natural temperate grasslands. They, uh, have, they occur in frost hollows and they're treeless. And the reason for that is that the cold temperatures during winter when cold air uh, moves down the slopes of hills, surrounding hills and mountains. And uh, uh, it's that cold air which, which kills the trees and the shrubs. Um, and that's the, that's the reason why they're treeless. But now we have uh, patches, remnant patches of them all over the countryside. Um, and only one or less than one percent of this grassland type remains. And so the federal government and also state and territory governments have 
decided that they are critically endangered. Unless something is, stops their, their loss, their destruction, they will soon become extinct. Next slide. So this is my, uh, a model of my thinking about how to restore these grasslands. They were for a long time uh, in existence. And then over the last 100, 150 years, uh, they have been used for grazing uh, of livestock, natural pastures for grazing of cattle and sheep. Um, and then in Canberra, and uh, these grasslands have become urban grasslands uh, and there's remnant patches and some sort of moderately sized patches around. Some of them are in reservation for conservation and they're managed uh, here in Canberra by the ACT government. But there are many in open spaces and it's these open spaces in which land care groups are interested in uh, managing them uh, better than they are currently. Many of these grasslands, even the remnants, are mown for hazard reduction within the city and peri-urban areas as well. These grasslands are often full of weeds and the question is how can we manage them as land carers to shift them from uh, being just remnant patches, uh, which are threatened, or the existence is threatened by uh, human factors, back to stable, larger, natural temperate grassland patches. It also would be good if we can join up the patches um, to improve connectivity within this grassland ecosystem. Next slide. This is the gin and dairy catchment in which uh, the native grassland restoration land care group uh, works, as it were. Um, this is an old image, 2006. You can see Belconnen development there and the growing development of Gungarlan. Um, and uh, we, and the New South Wales ACT border. Uh, there's quite a lot of farmland, particularly on that on the uh, western side of the border. Um, and we do have an experimental site on a farm there in that area. Uh, next image. So at uh, a site called Croke Place, which is just um, below the Ginadera Dam wall, if you know that, um, I obtained money, or the, the, uh, the catchment group obtained money from the ACT government to conduct and start conducting research. And we set up these five treatments there, which have been going for quite a few years now. Uh, first uh, burn there was in 2008. Control, no mowing or burning. Uh, low mow uh, what in November or a high mow uh, each November. Uh, we thought by uh, mowing at that stage that we might disadvantage um, phalaris, which is a, a major weed in our area, and some of those other ex tall growing exotic grasses. And then we had spring burns and summer burns. Uh, almost every two years. Um, next slide. And these are the results from these experiments. Um, we, and th this is the change in the number of exotic species called exotic plant or species richness on the left and native species richness on the right. Um, if we start with the, uh, with the native species, um, if you look at the, the black line, that's what happened with the control. So there was a small increase in native species uh, in that uh, treatment. The treatment though, which had the largest increase in native species, 
was the autumn burn treatment. And so the native species uh, trebled, I, yes, trebled compared with the control treatment. The spring burn, the dark blue line, uh, also increased um, initially, um, but not as much as the uh, autumn burn treatment. And mowing, um, either high or low, uh, produced a similar trend. So what we can see from, from this graph is that as a result of the autumn fires, there was uh, an immediate res uh, response in the number of native species in the plant community. They would have germinated from seed in the seed store um, uh, to a, a very high point. And then that treatment, and in fact, uh, the other treatments have all um, declined in native plant, plant species richness uh, to 2019 and today, actually, uh, they are all basically the same. And I think that decline was probably brought about by the drought that we had from, when was it, 2017, 18, 19? Um, uh, there was uh, loss of species then. And the reason I want to keep this study going is to see whether uh, there we can, by further burning, get a kick up again in native plant species. And on the left, we've got the exotic plants, the exotic species. And you can see that uh, for these treatments, there's different trajectories to what we've got for the native species. Uh, if you look at the uh, pale blue line, the autumn burn treatment after the, the, the fires in 2008 and 2011, there was a massive increase in uh, exotic species. In these plots, there's uh, two uh, infamous uh, exotic grasses. Um, we've got Chilean needle grass and African love grass and the occasional serrated tussock grass. And one of the interesting things that's emerged from these studies is that the kangaroo grass in the autumn and spring burn treatments have, has expanded um, over the, the treatment areas and they are now uh, strongly competing with African love grass and Chilean needle grass. So my theory is that uh, under regular burning, uh, uh, kangaroo grass is the top competitor and it's stronger and, and eventually I'm expecting that it will outcompete the Chilean needlegrass and African lovegrass. But of course, if you don't burn it, African lovegrass and Chilean needlegrass uh, grow happily, happily and, and can spread. Next slide. Uh, this is the autumn burn uh, uh, plot. And I wanted to show this, uh, in this plot, uh, there's a nice population of bulbine lilies, uh, which have spread an area with, with successive burns. In the autumn burn treatment, there's something like 10 native plant species that are not found in any of the other um, plots or other treatments. Next slide. We've also begin uh, looking at the survival of tube stock because it seems to us that this is a, although it's quite intense and, it, and uh, tube stock of these native species are quite expensive, um, it is a technique that uh, makes sense to do because uh, if these tube stock establish and flower and set seed, they can be a source of, of uh, new recruits into the plant community. Um, so here's a number of, of sites and we planted at each of these sites, uh, yam daisy, chocolate lily, bulbine lily, yellow buttons, billy buttons. And you can see uh, that the billy buttons were the best survivors, but that the, um, and also bulbine lily 
survived pretty well. Chocolate lilies as well. But yam daisies, which were the, uh, the classic um, tuberous plant which Aboriginal people cultivated by fire and, uh, and farmed uh, as a source of carbohydrate, didn't do very well at all. And yellow buttons didn't do very well at all. So this, there was differences in the sites in the survival of these planted tube stock. And so we've got to do further analysis on this data to find out really what's going on as to why these difference, why there are differences in the survival of these species. Uh, here I put in red the species uh, in which there's been poor survival. Next image. So the summary is that we think that uh, the best management of remnant patches of urban grassland, uh, of natural temperate grassland, is autumn burning uh, and re reintroductions. Um, seeding uh, is often problematic, so that's why we think that uh, planting of tube stock is the way forward. Um, uh, now, why might uh, autumn fire work better than spring fire? Um, spring fire, of course, is problematic in that there's usually a narrow uh, opportunity to burn. That you know, you've got to wait for growth to to dry off, and then you're it's often close to the fire season, and you can't burn anyhow. Um, in autumn burning, you've got from say in uh, beginning of March through to uh, May, uh, three months in which uh, uh, it, the weather is usually settled and it's ideal for burning. Um, and uh, that seems to be a good time for germination of many of the native species as well. And, uh, um, and I think that's the reason why uh, uh, um, Autumn burning is better than spring burning. In spring burning, it might germinate plants, but then they have to survive the heat of summer, and many of them don't. Next image. Uh, I want to talk about these post-fire effects on, on kangaroos and stock. Um, I think everyone knows that when paddocks are burned, kangaroos will be attracted to those paddocks and they'll closely graze for a time the burnt areas. Um, another thing I'd like to note is that sheep and probably cattle productivity may rise when grazing recently burnt areas um, because of greater plant species richness and more nutritious forage. And I want to show you some results of research uh, done in China on this issue, um, which uh, I think is interesting. And thirdly, uh, patchy burn achieved with cool season burning will provide heterogeneity to a paddock, providing better habitat for restoration of birds, reptiles, plants and insects. And patchiness in the vegetation can be uh, maintained longer with light stocking. Next slide. Uh, this is work done in China and I had a connection uh, with this work and I partly supervised uh, the student who did it. Um, what she did was uh, what we call a cafeteria experiment where she placed forages, uh, different forages or dif yeah, different species, um, the foliage of different species in feeding buckets and then uh, the sheep were allowed to choose from the buckets and they would eat of different species and they of course would eat different amounts of the forage and and the student was able to calculate the the daily intake uh, in relation to the species uh, that were on offer so she would do it for one day, she might only offer one plant species to the sheep. And on another day, often offer different, uh, a greater number of plant species um, or buckets of different plant species. 
And what the study showed is that uh, the greater the, um, the number of species on offer to the sheep, the greater is their intake of forage and the energy which they consume, that's on the top right hand graph. Um, and in the bottom right hand, you can see that the protein intake increased with the species, uh, with greater species on offer. So we can, can conclude that the maintenance of plant species richness in rangelands or pastoral lands will benefit both domestic herbivore production and the conservation of biodiversity. So here's a good reason for conserving the biodiversity. Uh, it, uh, it, it means that the, uh, the sheep domestic stock grazing are more likely to have better performance than they would if, if uh, um, there was not that high richness of species. Next slide. Um, this is research work which was done by Brett Howland for his PhD at the ANU. And I uh, think this is excellent research because it addresses the question of the benefit of patchiness in the grassland. Um, and what this research showed is that patchiness from cool season burning will provide better habitat for increasing biodiversity uh, when the paddock is lightly stocked. Obviously, if you have cool season burning and you heavily stock the paddock, uh, then there won't be any benefit from this. And in this paddock survey in the capital region, Brent found that, that um, the occurrence and abundance of reptiles and in another paper, um, birds, increased with patchiness of the grassland. And the authors, because there are other supervisors, um, conclude that to maximize species of reptiles uh, and their abundance, um, managers need to subject different areas of the landscape to moderate and low grazing intensities and limit the occurrence and extent of high level grazing. Um, I've given the reference there uh, to this paper. If you uh, type that title into any search engine, um, you'll, you'll find, you can find a uh, PDF of the paper to read. Next slide. So we come to, I guess, the ultimate question. Can small uh, landholders cool burn paddocks? Well, yes, of course, but to do so successfully, um, there's a lot of preparation required and also consultation with your local rural fire service brigade. Need to keep an eye on the weather. And of course, it's essential to notify your neighbors of your intent to prescribe burn. I'd also like to point out uh, that should your fire get out of control and damage neighbours' assets, you may be legally liable. And uh, this can often be a, a deterrent for farmers and, and graziers uh, in their use of fire. So one needs to be very careful, but I can assure you that if you are, um, uh, and you're always able to keep the fire under control, then uh, there's no problem. Next image. I've put here uh, some uh, resources which you might like to look into. Um, I think, uh, first of all, um, the, the, the classic book to read about prescribed burning is by Phil Cheney and Andrew Sullivan uh, called Grass Fires fuel, weather, and fire behavior. It's published by CSIRO, and it costs about $45. Uh, but I highly recommend that book. Um, you can also look on the website for New South Wales Department of Planning and Conservation. Uh, they have um, sections there about fire management for biodiversity uh, conservation. And also the Rural Fire Service. Um, 
they are worth. They have some good information as well, and and you would personally get uh, good information by uh, by talking with um, those volunteers. As far as biodiversity uh, management is concerned, um, uh, there are some good booklets which have been published. And again, if you if you Google uh, or put the names of the booklets for the yeah into into a search engine, uh, you'll be able to easily download a PDF of these publications. Um, uh, Josh Dara and co-authors uh, published a good book a booklet on biodiversity in the paddock, a land manager's guide. And Jackie Stoll and Suzanne Prober published uh, an excellent booklet on jewels in the landscape, managing very high conservation value ground layers in box gum grassy woodlands. Well worth a read. And then Jackie Stoll and several others uh, published uh, an easy to use method for checking uh, changes in your vegetation to see whether you're on track with uh, your, meeting your aims. And the last image or page, please. Here we are. I want to uh, thank a number of people um, who have uh, contributed to this work in the land, uh, land care space. Uh, the ACT uh, um, uh, department and CSRO Jindera Experiment, uh, Experiment Station and John Connolly, uh, they have mown uh, plots in this study. And the ACT Rural Fire Service, particularly the Malonglo, Hall, Wallaroo and Gungarland Brigades, um, have burnt the plots. So they've done a fantastic job, um, and we appreciate and uh, that that contribution. And Warren Mueller has uh, helped with statistical analysis, and the Native Grassland Restoration Land Care Group members have done plant surveys. Surveys, very grateful to them, and the Jindera Catchment Group uh, has done an excellent job of administrating and providing support. So thank you for listening. Over to you, Alex, for questions. Okay, thanks, Ken. I had myself on mute, so if you're <laughs> wondering where I went, <laughs> I was just on mute, just so I didn't, nothing from this end um, interrupted you. So that was, that was a really good presentation, thank you. Um, would it be okay if I kick off with a question from one of our um, audience members that they sent in uh, when they registered? So the question is, was, I have always preferred not to burn as my key goal is to retain as much carbon on and in my paddocks as possible. Burning seems like, like sending carbon off into the sky. Do you have a comment about that? Well, it certainly does send carbon up into the sky. But the thing to remember is that unless the vegetation changes in its structure, say, for instance, becomes less woody, then it will recover and, and uh, assimilate uh, the same amount of carbon uh, as was lost in a fire. So it's a neutral effect. And the modelers um, who, who look at uh, the, the factors that determine uh, changes in the CO2 in the atmosphere um, call this a neutral management. But if, for instance, the fire killed shrubs and trees, which, were, uh, which, had, uh, which yeah, had accumulated carbon, um, and, and they were destroyed and the structures of vegetation changed just to a grassland, uh, then that would be a net loss of, of carbon. Okay. Do you know through your studies, Ken, whether um, burning affected the, the weeds or germination of weeds? You, you spoke a little bit about African lovegrass and Chile nettlegrass. What about the broadleaf? late weeds did you did you study that at all no not really uh and mm. certainly 
broadleaf weeds uh, do outcompete many um, seedlings, make it difficult for native uh, species to establish again from seed. Um, my th thought on that is that weeds are always going to be with us, and many of them we've just got to live with. We might be able to partially control them, reduce down their numbers, but it's going to be almost impossible to completely eliminate them from our vegetation as much as we would like to. Um, but I think we need to have our focus on the native plants and animals and try and do our best to, uh, to by management to provide a healthy environment for them to prosper and survive. Mm. So I think, uh, yes, we need to sort of think about weeds, but uh, we need to think more about retaining the natural elements in our landscapes. Okay. So you talked a little bit about, um, like, you, you showed a little bit in your um, graphs about the frequency of fire burning. Um, and I guess the question was how many fire cycles before the effect is useful? You did show that a little bit, and then there was a bit of a drop off in, in, in later years. Um, do, you, do you have a comment about that? Look, we don't really understand uh, what is the right frequency for burning. Um, these experiments are very expensive to do and long term, and uh, it's not easy to, to address that question. Um, in the study, which I showed you the results of, uh, try, I burnt every two years or tried to burn every two years um, because I wanted to push the system uh, as far as I could. Um, I don't think you'd get annual burns possible in this environment, but certainly you can burn most uh, second year years. So um, that's the reason I, I've continued that treatment. But one, if, um, but certainly less frequent burning obviously is going to have a benefit uh, and that's worthwhile uh, uh, doing. Um, but there's no uh, hard and fast rule for what is the best fire frequency. Okay. But what, what's it, what has emerged is the importance of patchiness in burning. And again, I'm not across that as a, 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 in terms of actually applying it. I think it's difficult to do. Um, but um, Aboriginal people have traditionally done that and it makes sense to provide that, uh, that patchiness in the landscape that you wouldn't get by, by just burning in, in a conventional way. Yeah, and do you know if, um, or, or if there was any studies on how, or you mentioned kangaroos, how burns affect um, like fauna or other fauna? We don't have a good handle on that at all. Um, mm. In the Howland study, uh, he compared uh, grassland sites which varied in the, the height at which the, gra the uh, grasses had been grazed. Um, and uh, uh, so he, tried, he, 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 he got good relationships um, showing that uh, where uh, grazing was heavy, there was less uh, faunal biodiversity. Um, but no, we don't really have a good handle on that. Okay, okay. So Ken, I'm going to start, I'm going to go through the questions from our live audience now, if that's okay to, for you, and I'll yeah. read them out and just get you to um, answer them. So Rob said this, this is a fascinating presentation, thank you. Um, very interested to know whether cultural or cool, cool burning used principally for bushfire fuel reduction follows the same techniques with the same management issues as cultural or cool burning for ecosystem management? Or are the two aims really the same? Uh, average, well, we can think about Aboriginal burning uh, as either being, uh, well, I've called it um, cultural burns and, and, and uh, cool season burns, which is the cool season burns is, is understandable. Um, 
So they are very different. My uh, experience is that uh, it's very hard and uh, to understand cultural burns and Aboriginal people may not be prepared to share that knowledge with us because it's something that's sacred. And I do know that in these cultural burns, uh, the, the role of women uh, is very important and separate to the role of men. Men would light the fires, but uh, the decision as to where to burn and when to burn would be made by women in the community. It would also be a time when um, uh, uh, stories would be shared and, and, uh, um, and, and there'll be a teaching of children uh, about sacred matters. There's just no way that, that we can sort of enter into that easily and I, I, it would have if we moved in that direction, it would be have to be um, uh, the decision of Aboriginal people. Clearly, that, that's to be respected. Um, but cool season burn, uh, whether it's whether it's uh, patchy burns, uh, is pretty easy to understand and to do. And uh, and I and that's a new. Uh, I think it's, yeah, it's a new method for thinking about uh, burning uh, Australian grasslands. It hasn't been practised very much. And where there's hazard reduction burning, uh, they would be, uh, they would certainly not be uh, cool season burns. Although um, uh, I know here in the, in the ACT, the government is, is, um, uh, opening up that door, as it were, and trying to move into that space. And there is an Aboriginal fire team um, who are practising uh, cool se season burning. Um, now, I'm not too sure if that's answered the question of, of Rob. It was Rob, wasn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. Yes. Um, I think, yeah. I mean, it's a, compl it's a complex um, uh, um, space. So I think that that is, that is what you've, what you've spoken about makes a lot of sense. Um, so I guess we're just touching on the issue. There's two questions that are quite the same here. How does one determine how large the patches are should be in any particular grassland system and the frequency of the burn? Okay. I, I must admit that I don't have experience in, in, uh, in patch burning. Uh, my experiment, the experimental plots which we burn aren't very large, so it'd be a large patch. But I think patches could be any size, and it would be it'd be hard to, well, if if you drop a match in uh, with the wind at your back, and you can imagine the fire would take off, uh, then at some point you've got to be able to beat it out and stop the fire from spreading, or it may be just a dense patch of grass and it burns well and there's less grass around it and it sort of runs out of fuel and the, and, uh, and that determines the patch size. I don't know that there's any studies which would tell us, um, that, you know, the ideal size of the patches. I haven't seen any. Um, and as far as frequency is concerned, um, Again, I really can't, there's no prescriptions for that. Um, but I imagine with patch burning, uh, uh, one would probably burn uh, patches that weren't burnt in the first patch burn. So there'd be an alteration in, in, the, in the, uh, the, the location of these various patches. I don't know quite how you do that, but... Um, uh, but I don't imagine that you would just repeatedly burn the same patch year after, or every two or three years. Mm -hmm. um, the important principle is that you leave some of the vegetation unburnt around a patch in which um, lizards and, and other creatures uh, that would have difficulty escaping from the fire uh, can find safety and survive there and then reinvade the bird patch. Yeah, yeah. So um, Kat has asked, um, do you know the story about button grass in Tasmania? 
No, I don't. Perhaps Pat, Pat can just explain um, about that. Yeah, I guess if, if there is a link or something, perhaps you could put it into the chat function um, and share it with the rest of us. That would be great. Um, our New South Wales RFS only allows pile burns at the moment. Are there any examples in the capital region of regular ecological burns being allowed on small holdings? Is that something that we can delve into, do you think? Sure. Um, uh, so if I understood the question right, the, 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 uh, the person um, wants to know whether, whether governments allow or the RFS allow um, burns uh, yeah. on farms. Yeah. Um, uh, the RFS grades that, that, that have helped us with our burning um, I think uh, a cooperative, um, and and, uh, a, and I imagine that they would, as long as there's a clear reason for it, um, and they uh, and I know that the Malongolo Brigade, for instance, which we've had uh, um, a lot of dealings with, um, you, you know that they, they, they are available to give advice, and I think we we need to listen carefully to that advice because they've got a lot of experience um, over the years. Um, uh, um, but I, I'm not aware of of uh, people being prevented from burning. But it may be that it's out of season and it's just too too dangerous to uh, um, uh, to allow that fire the, the fires to take place. Mm. Okay. So, uh, um, apart, uh, uh, Rob's just said that you answered his question, so thank you. Um, and there's one from Ben. Apart from pole burns, I've only ever been granted permission by the RFS to burn bush or grass in New South Wales for hazard reduction purposes, a hazard reduction certificate which can only be done once every seven years. Okay. What is the approval that should be sought for these ecological burns? Ah, um, I, I find difficulty in answering that. I think... Yeah, uh, that, that's yeah. okay. But, um, um, yeah, I, I, re I really don't know. And You've just got to have the conversation with RFS. Now, I didn't really touch on the question of hazard reduction burnings. I th clearly, there's a place for fire breaking around um, houses uh, in, in uh, before a fire season and around your property and fences and other uh, uh, valuable infrastructure um, and even to protect your stock. Um, and I think there's a real place for do, a need for that, but that's not necessarily e ecological, uh, although there might be some good spin-offs uh, for ecology uh, by doing those hazard reduction burnings. But uh, that certainly is a very important thing for, uh, for farmers to consider. And, and as I said, you know, we've had, at the moment we've got these exceptional rains, there's going to be a huge biomass of grass around um, in summertime, and uh, and there may be um, uh, you know serious fires at that time. Let's hope not. Yeah. Okay. So I, I just wanted to um, just let Ben know, and, and any questions specifically related to the RFS. Um, we did run a workshop with Jason McWhorter um, last, uh, it was in at the end of 2020, um, which people can um, look at on our website. I can also take some of these specific questions and, and ask um, Jason or one of his colleagues about the answers to them. Um, the other thing that we did do uh, was we had a cultural burning workshop with Dan Barber. Um, and there's also that is that resource is on our website, so people can um, 
actually have a look at that and and find the question you know the answers to some of these questions but if there are some that we can't answer and if you still got any after this webinar you're more than welcome to send them to me and we will try and find out for you but I mean to be fair to Ken um you, you, I don't think that you would be able to necessarily um, answer these questions specifically about the RFS mm. um there's good information on their website and yeah. you know, I would encourage, you know, open communication with them and, and talking it through with them what you what you want to do. Yeah, for sure. So I, I just posted one link and I'll, I'll um, post the other one from Den, um, Barbara, um, which may sort of, you know, just provide a bit more information to people about those um, questions of cultural burning um, and also the advice from RFS about um, not that wasn't specifically related to, to cultural burns, but just about the process of burning if you wanted to on your farm. Um, so I'll just paste that there. And I think I may have um, just posted something just to Kathy, so I'll post that one again as well. So I'm just checking my questions here. Ken, I think we may have um, covered everything. Um, Chris just had a comment that maybe we can follow up with the RFS. I think it's possible to get permission to do this kind of burning as long as the usual preventative measures are implemented to reduce the chances of the fire getting out of control. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great comment. Thank you, Chris. Um, and there's just a few comments there. Um, it just saying thank you to, thanks. It's nice to hear about your, um, your experience and thanks for coming to share it. And also, um, Okay, there's another comment about um, smallholders in New, New South Wales cannot even do an asset protection burn around buildings, etc. I'm not sure that that's correct, but we will, I'll definitely, I've got a record of your questions and I will follow up with um, with the RFS and, and just get to see if we can get some help with that. Okay, yeah, all right. So I'm just going to um, share my screen now, Ken, and finish this off and we'll come back and say a final goodbye. Um, so just bear with me for a sec. So as I mentioned earlier, it'd be great if you could please fill out the Zoom survey at the end of this webinar and provide us with your feedback. And I guess that, that it could also be an opportunity that you could type some of those questions in if you wanted to, or you're more than welcome, as I said, to send me an email if you have anything specific and we'll definitely try and find out the answers. It sounds like it's a topic that people are really interested in. So that's, that's great to know. Just letting you know that we have an annual general meeting and farm tour on on Sunday the 6th of November and we're having lunch and then we're having a farm tour with Kelly from the Yoke Folk in Gundaroo and a short annual general meeting and that is free for members and their families. And just uh, another reminder that we do have a um, we have a Facebook page that you can get involved with um, you can you can post your messages there. You can tell us what's going on on your farm, and you can also find out information about what's going on. I, I post things from time to time there um, about what's that I think might be uh, interesting to small landholders. We also have a YouTube channel, as I mentioned before, where, where I have put all our previous webinar recordings. So there is one from Jason. On that, on our um, on our YouTube channel. So if you wanted to go uh, in and have a look at that, you're more than welcome to, um, and you're able to do that. And just a final reminder about the Small Farms Network Capital Region um, website. 
there's lots of things you can find on that website, notwithstanding the resources page where we have uh, published our event summaries. They have links to further information and, and this one that I've done with Ken will be up there soon. There is also an opportunity for you to become a member if you would like to do that. And also you can join in join um, the mailing list for our free newsletter if you'd like to. Membership costs $22 a year, and that just enables us to continue to do this type of work. But it also enables you to um, access some free events for members. You can advertise in the newsletter. So if you had something to buy, swap, sell, for example, and you'll also get early event notification of anything um, in the future. So Ken, I'm just going to stop my share there. And um, yes, Kathy, I can definitely send the links um, out and I can probably pop them back up now if that helps. Um, would you like me to put them back up now? Do you think Ken, those links? Yes, or sure. Are talking about the link? Maybe they're talking about the links for your um, your presentation, and I can definitely do that. We can we can pop those up on the website. Mm. All right, thank you, Ken. That was really informative, and it was great to learn about your research. Um, and thanks so much for spending your time with us this evening. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it very much, and I hope one day I might be able to meet some of you in person. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Ken. Bye. Bye.